This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. After the All-Star break and an Eastern Canadian swing for the Flames, we're back as always. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, why don't we start off with some All-Star thoughts. Did you watch the game this year? I I watched uh, the Pacific Division play both games. I didn't watch the other one. So it was kind of an interesting year for the All-Star game. I feel that the three-on-three thing was refined this year over last year. And as much as I wish we could just play five-on-five All-Star hockey like we used to, of all the gimmicky things they've done, I actually don't mind the three on three. I agree. It's it for an all star game. It's supposed to be kind of frivolous. It's not like Major League Baseball where something actually matters. So it it is what it is. I don't see there being any drawbacks on having it three on three. The players seem to have fun, and that's the important thing. Yeah, I, I would like if there's a little bit more writing on it. You and I have talked about that in the past with, you know, winning a home ice advantage or something in the Stanley Cup. But it's I like that there's money attached to it now. But I thought it was a fun game. I like the tournament format too, where you're seeing a few different games be played. But uh, it was I didn't like the uniforms this year. I thought they were kind of ugly. But, you know, they're L.A. colors, and L.A. colors historically been kind of ugly. Oh, the black and white ones weren't too bad. The, the yellow and the purple, though, were kind of terrible. If I remember last year, there was two uniforms. There's just a light and a dark, and they change based on who is playing. And this year, yeah. there was four of them. Yeah, there's black and white, which wasn't bad. The yellow and gray, I thought, was just too light. Uh, the purple and the yellow were bad. I'm really surprised that they didn't go with, like, throwback All-Star jerseys for the 100th year. Yeah, something like one of those bright orange ones or... From the 80s or yeah, whatever. I, th- I think they're trying to go with that with the stars in the bottom. But it just, I don't know. They look too modern to me. Yeah. Uh, well, really, how many all-star jerseys through all the years have there been that the jerseys actually look decent? Yeah, there's been some terrible ones. Um, do you remember the soccer ones in 2000, 2001? Yeah. I do. And then, actually, my favorites, they were about that time. Let me go look. They actually looked like Dallas Stars jerseys. They were big, like, stars. Yeah. And I actually like those for an all-star jersey. Yeah, um, those were in the early ni- to mid-90s, weren't they? Yeah, and that was, like, the last year they did West versus East. Yeah, I think, like, 94, 95, something like that. Yeah, I see them here on NHL jerseys at the uh, 95, 96 All-Star game. Ah, uh, there you go. And those I liked, because I thought those are, like, star jerseys. Yeah. For the All-Stars. My favorite in recent memory was the one in Minnesota in 2004, where they were kind of, like, a very retro-themed old-time look. That was right after the, uh, or right before the lockout? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've tried to do a few of the retro ones in the past, and I don't know, sometimes they do well, sometimes they fail. Do you remember when they did the North America versus, was it, no, maybe it is the the one you're thinking of, when they had sort of the off-white yeah. sort of retro? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of those. So, I don't know, all-star jerseys, I'd be curious to see what the NHL sales of them are, is, because I can't see them being huge sellers. No. Well, you got to figure that unless you're a super fan of a particular player where you've got like every jersey that that player's ever played in, you're not really going to go out of your way to drop $150 on a all-star jersey regardless of what whomever it is. I bet they sell well in the arena, but I can't Probably. see anyone buying them, you know, online or at their local arena. Well, like last year when I went to games after the All Star break, like I'd see maybe one or two, and that's it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's the, the like you said, you got to be a fan of the player, not so much the team. The other thing I wanted to get your opinion on is this hundredth year patch that the teams are wearing. Uh, they all added the patch to their right sleeves, and I don't know. To me, the right sleeve, or at least where they have it, 
It's really weird looking. It's almost like they just shoved it in there. Usually these kind of yeah. patches go well, right on like, the front. Yeah, like uh, when they had the 75th anniversary one, it was like right on the right shoulder. And like on the front of the jersey, like opposite where the letters would be. And yeah. th that looked fine. So I was like, kind of expecting them to do something similar, but they opted for the arms instead for some reason. And <laughs> I would say it even just if, looks out of place. It does. Like there's never anything there, and I think even if they would have replaced, and I know they probably can't do it because they're licensing, but put it over the Reebok logo at the back, that wouldn't looked okay. But it just it looks like it's shoved in there, especially on the Flames jersey. Like there's so little space in there as it is. It looks like they're cramming it in. And some teams like the Oilers, it goes right over the stripes. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't well thought out but and they're always in different positions i think isn't the leafs above the numbers and the flames below the numbers yeah uh, it wasn't very well done and no. i agree like it's just it, you sh should have been able to see those kind of problems coming up so why not put it somewhere you know like on the front of the jersey over the logo <laughs> on the right side like the, yeah. where the 75th anniversary one was what's well, it i almost you know there's nothing there on any team so just stick it there well that's what i'm looking at nobody has patches there used to always be patched on the front but nobody's got them so that seems like the logical place yeah everybody and seems to have a shoulder patch now i know and like that's why our, like having it on the front of the jersey it's not like where san jose and buffalo used to have numbers on the front of their jersey like those are gone as far as i know so yep. you can just easily slide that in there it's uniform you can see it plain as day on the front of the jersey and well and if you're looking at it for promotion it too. A feature yeah oh no buffalo still has their numbers there but you could find a place for it just put it like under the number or they have nothing on their shoulders put on their shoulder like make an exception yeah. But yeah, I think like on the front it becomes a feature. You'll see it in all the photos they're taking this year. That's not going to happen if it's on the arm. Yep. So, I don't know. I uh, you can get them put on if anyone wants one. You can get them at Fanatic, but I I don't like I don't mind the look of the patch. I just think the positioning is terrible. And I asked them if they could put it on the front and they said they wouldn't. So, like, well, I don't want one then. So with the All-Star game behind... I wonder actually next year with all the new jerseys if they're going to keep that there or move it somewhere else. I have a feeling that they'll probably take the 100th year patch off. I I think if they're trying to sell a bunch of new jerseys, they'll want to sell them unpatched. I would imagine that you could probably buy it as an extra, like maybe the teams will wear them, but I don't think it'll come standard on the fan no. versions. And yeah, you're right, maybe they'll move it somewhere else. It sort of makes you wonder if that's the positioning if RB or if uh, Adidas is almost thinking of getting rid of arm stripes and that's why they're putting it there. Or moving arm numbers. We could have very weird looking jerseys, man. I'm kind of wondering with almost a morbid curiosity on what all the jerseys are going to look like. Cause I thought that, something of the tells me, like, eh, not so much. Well, speaking of All-Star Weekend, I had kind of expected them to show off the jerseys at All-Star Weekend. Yeah, so did I. I thought that would be the perfect place to show them off. And we haven't seen anything yet. And The only thing we're hearing about them is that uh, Gary Bettman has finally said that advertising won't be on NHL jerseys. He, in the past, said maybe it would be. And now he's saying he, he would need an, uh, an amount of money so astronomical he can't even think of what it would be to put them on there. Mind you, remember, there's the same guy who said the league wasn't looking at expanding either. I know. You always got to take anything he says with a grain of salt. So. I... I think, though, that he does not want advertising on the jerseys themselves because you also, like, when you're in a situation like that, you have to know your fan base. And when basically all the fans are, like, they make fun of the European leagues who have ads on the jerseys, that it it's not like there's a, any real reception for it at all. So I can see why he's opting to just, you know, at least for now, not have ads. We had ads on the, I'm just checking here. We had ads on the World Cup jersey. Uh, the, oh, I'm the, sure that you'll have ads on like every non-NHL event. Like if you uh, look at photos from the, that celebrity all-star game, there was ads all over them. 
Yeah, and I'd be okay to have them on like All Star jerseys and World Cup jerseys, but I just don't want them on the thirty teams because that's yeah I don't know I think it's going to be hard too. You, I mean, you look at soccer and they change all the time, and I think with the cost of NHL jerseys, you're not going to have an appetite from fans to buy a new one every two years. Oh, I know, and yeah, like if you're like say a Manchester United fan, like you 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 got like this big advertisement right in the middle and then like the actual logo like where the nhl numbers are and it's just tiny and that's it like to me like i if i was buying a jersey like that i wouldn't want it to be corrupted by the advertisement so no and if it was you'd expect a significant discount you know if i'm gonna be wearing like a big mcdonald's logo i'm expecting that jersey's not going to cost me over 100 bucks anymore because mcdonald's is subsidizing it yeah. And you know that wouldn't honestly, happen. Yeah, honestly, I wouldn't buy one, but that's just me. Well, and that's the whole reason they change them is so fans will buy new ones. So, yeah, I think you're right. It would not have the uh, the desired effect. Well, let's get back to the flames, shall we, Matt? Sure thing. Only one flame at the All-Star game, but before the All-Star game, the flames had a three-game Eastern Two. Canadian swing. Uh, well, yeah. they tr- that's right. Yeah. Tr- Toronto, yeah, had- Montreal, Ottawa. We talked after the Toronto game, um, but that was the first of it. So really, we had the the two games for the week. Um, the Flames played Montreal, and we were both worried after our last show that Montreal, at least I was, Montreal might decimate the Flames. And I think that prediction pretty much came true. Radulov notched a pair of goals, and Carey Price made 30 saves as the Canadians defeated the Flames 5-1. to one. Honestly, uh, if the Flames were rolling at full steam and they ran into Carey Price, I still don't think they would have won that game. So, uh, and the fact that they've been playing mediocre hockey lately, uh, you could like you could just kind of pencil in the L <laughs> before the game started. <laughs> yeah, I think that you might be right about that, but I think that they could have at least done better than five to one. Oh, I agree. But the team's struggling, and that's what happens with struggling teams is they get blown out by good teams. And, I mean, if you take a look at the stats, the one stat that's held true for me most of the year is not the last little bit, which is when the Flames get uh, less penalty minutes, they win. They had a ton more shots or hits. They had 32 hits to Montreal's 16, 20 shot blocks. But it just, I don't know, the team looked like they have... For the last week and a half, they just fell apart. They were out of gas. They didn't seem like they wanted to play. Listless entirely. And just going through the motions, waiting for the All-Star break. Yeah, and not even finishing checks, not even you know fighting as hard as they should against the boards. No, a very pedestrian effort, and that's being polite. <laughs> the only goal of the game was a power play goal from Sam Bennett uh, with Kachuk and Hamilton getting the assist. So three guys with are actually, one second left in the game. Like, w- yeah, one wait. second left really didn't matter, but yeah, at least we broke the shutout. And the other game, the Flames were in the nation's capital taking on Ottawa. And this was actually, I thought, at least the overtime I saw. Um, I, I watched most of the game, but with 30.2 seconds left in overtime, Johnny Gaudreau scored to help the Flames end a four-game losing streak with a 3-2 win against the Senators. From what I saw in this one, and, um, you know, I watched, so I watched the first and part of the second and the third in overtime. I missed the first part of the second, but... I thought this wasn't a bad first period. I thought the, the Flames came out. It wasn't the best first period we've seen, but compared to the last week, I thought that this looked more like Flames hockey. Yeah, and they didn't give up the that last-minute first period goal like the previous two games. Yeah, you're right. They didn't give that up. They, I mean, it was... It was 2 nothing for the Flames. Uh, sorry, 0-0 for the Flames after the first. They didn't give it up, but they also didn't score. Yeah. And when the Flames score first, they usually do well. But, I mean, they weren't playing to 100%, but I looked at this and said, okay, this is sort of Calgary Flames hockey. You can see some semblance of this team. And then the Flames scored for... Um, the Flames scored two in the second period. Michael Furland and Sean Monahan both got a goal in period two. It was Furland sixth and Monahan 16th. 
So I was glad to see on that Monaghan goal, I was glad to see that it was Monaghan Goudreau. They were put back together. And I think between the two, that goal and the overtime goal, it was kind of nice to see some chemistry between those guys again. Of all the flames to me, and I don't know what you thought, Matt, but from what I saw of the game, of all the flames that were noticeable, I thought Lance Bomo was one of the hardest working. He was physical. He won a lot of races. I thought that he was looking really good for the team all night. Yeah, well, he also has to realize that his job is on the line. And with Garnet Hathaway being sidelined with injuries, you know that once he's healthy again, he's going to be taking his spot back. So Boma has to do something to displace either Furland or somebody else. And I think Furland, Boma, or Freddie Hamilton are the three. Yeah, so it, he has to show his worth and light a fire under himself. Otherwise, he's going to get passed by on the depth chart. For the first time in 10 games, the Flames scored the first goal of the game. So that's not really the stats you want to be seeing. You want to be getting that first goal. And it was nice to see, and I think it really brought the team alive when Furland scored, but they still looked very pedestrian. I thought that overall in the overtime, I don't know about you, I thought that Ottawa played a better overtime Oh, overall. for sure. I was assuming, like based on what I was seeing, that your predictions from last week were going to come true exactly, where we'd get to overtime and then lose, but they managed to capitalize on that turnover and Gaudreau and Backlund you know that's an interesting pairing during that uh, the three on three overtime it's not the first time that they've scored I think that's like the fourth or fifth one that they've scored together and I think maybe that should be a combo moving forward instead of Gaudreau Monaghan I think if overtime. I think if Backlund or Froelich weren't doing so well, you might even see Backlund moved up to a Goudreau line full-time. Mm-hmm. Or Goudreau put onto the backland froelich line, but that's really a, a defensive line, so they wouldn't do that. But, you know, it's nice that we can move those pieces around, though, but that tic-tac-toe in the overtime, it's like this is the John, this is the Johnny Hockey that we're missing. Where is this every game? Well, sometimes you just need a bounce to go your way. And, like, how many times lately have we seen him get breakaways or two-on-O's or two-on-ones and something will screw up on either his part or the goalie making a decent save and where he's normally converting those chances. So sometimes just having one go in plus having a great all-star game with four points that might be enough to spark him to go on a run over the next few weeks. I'm hoping so, because we need it. If the Flames want to make the playoffs, they need him to do that. So after the Montreal game, before they're showing in Ottawa, and I think part of the reason that they showed so well in Ottawa was they really got tongue-lashed by the coach. If you listen to some of the... And it was very you know popular in the news here, but if you listen to what Gullison said, he said it was a pathetic display, no bite back, no kick back. Our top guys didn't do anything. We needed someone to step up. You just have to man up. We play well. One bad thing happens and we crumple. Our, star, our starts have been good, but one little shot goes in and we crumple. We have no resolve to stay with it. And hearing that from a guy like Gullison, who's usually pretty even keeled, you know that he's had enough. Yeah, well, anybody would. It, you look at how that t- type of play happened, and like I remember back when uh, it, during the Aginla years, that uh, there was a w- one game where uh, the Flames went up five nothing on Chicago and lost, and then the next day they played Columbus, and they had a very much a similar game in Columbus as they did in Montreal where there was no pushback or anything. And, like, I remember then being pissed off by the lack of compete in the players, and it is a distressing and worrying sign when, after getting thumped by the Oilers for the fourth time, then getting thumped by Toronto, and then getting thumped by Montreal, like, you guys have to wake up, you know, like, it's okay to get blown out every once in a while. Every team, whether you are a Stanley Cup champion or the worst team in the league, it happens. But it's 
how you react in the games following that that matter and to have three stinkers in a row and four really if you count the nashville game it's anybody would be pissed off by that like you're just not getting the results period and you need to snap the team out of that kind of habit otherwise it becomes a habit and then the team instead of looking to have potential at maybe becoming a stanley cup team you might end up having a team that's like the oilers of the last 10 years where they just they have talent but they can't ever find that next year and I mean, if you look at this, this is not the first time. I was looking back through previous schedules. There seems to be one of these just terrible streaks for the team every year. They seem to go on one hot streak and one really cold streak every year for the past couple. And if you want to be a playoff team, you can't be doing that. No, and especially when losses are more important than wins. Uh like a five game losing streak is far more damaging to a team than a five game winning streak is in a positive direction. So it's one of those situations where a team can go from being like a playoff contender to like nearly dead last. And like, if you looked at the point percentage, the team was in fifth with the fifth worst point per game record heading into the Ottawa game like that's how far they had fallen just because they lost a handful of games in a row and like while they were still in a playoff spot or just outside you know once the other teams actually play their games and make up some points because of that like the Flames could drop like a stone right to the bottom of the league and basically be in the same spot that they were a year ago and this team isn't that bad. Like they shouldn't be a top five pick team this year. But you know, if the players aren't playing, guess where you're gonna be? So Matt, let me ask you a question um, that I've been thinking about for the last little bit. So in the past, people have uh, you know contributed some of the Flames' problems to the management, and I think we've changed management. We have a good management team in now. Would you agree? The only person I don't like in the organization uh, from, like, their the results from their job is the AHL coach, uh, Huska. I'm just not seeing the, the progression from a bunch of players that you should be seeing. But, well, let's just focus on the NHL team for a sec. Yeah, but, like, other than that, like, I don't really have any complaints about anybody. No, so. we got a good management team. We switched up the coaches. People gave the coaches a hard time, but we've seen that yeah, the like the Sigalette special might be. But like other than that, like it, it's few that. Yeah, I mean the coaches have changed things. We've seen the power play get better, the penalty kill get better, all the things we said we need to get better. So I guess what my question to you is then is the only thing I can see that's been consistent among all these seasons where the players seem to not be turning on is the on-ice um, leadership, the captain, the alternates. Do you think maybe it's time to look elsewhere besides Giordano to lead this team? Not yet, but I know what you're saying. And, like, one thing that I think that uh, needs to happen is um, Johnny Gaudreau needs to focus more on his conditioning because, like, he was being interviewed at some point in the last little bit and like he had mentioned that like he doesn't really eat well still and like if you're not having your star player buy in like if you're say Lance Boma why are you gonna put in the effort when the so-called offensive leader of the team isn't doing anything to actually commit to being his best. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but is that also then not an organizational problem where if he's not doing what he should be, the team could find him or scratch him? And that might have to happen. And you know, I don't think it's... Jo I mean, I, it, Johnny's a big boy and he should be able to make his own decisions, but if the team is saying this is what we need and he's not doing it, you shouldn't be giving him star treatment. No. And, you know, the, sometimes... Uh, situations like that do end up requiring a player to be traded and i'm not saying to trade gaudreau but whether it's a bad influence player on the team or not whatever 
Like, it, you're going to eventually need to run into the point of players need to be accountable for their actions. And, like, it, we see this with Edmonton. They had a bad apple in Taylor Hall, and they traded him. Because he was not learning how to play defense on the ice at all. Was making the same rookie mistakes five years into his career. They get rid of him. Magically, the team's defensive problems as forwards go away. Because the rest of the team buys in that, hey, I actually have to do the right thing and play defense. Otherwise, I'm going to be out the door too. And you see this with other players that have left, like Justin Schultz and uh, Gagne with Columbus, that like they've learned to play the right way, and they're finding success. And so they got rid of one of the problem players on their team. Magically, the rest of the players fall in line, and the team is performing significantly better. And while, yes, McDavid does help, it's not a 30-point turnaround type of difference in the team. But again, I wonder if some of that, and you know, every team's a different scenario, but I'm thinking, okay, the team captain should be part of who's holding that guy accountable. And I mean, if that's not yeah. happening, if we're not seeing Johnny oh, agree. eating right, is, is this captain the right captain? Is this the guy who's motivating the team? Is this guy, and I don't know enough about Gio behind the scenes. No, is this the guy that's kicking their butt when they have a terrible loss like Montreal? Is this the guy yelling at his teammates in the dressing room? And, you know, that's yeah. not acceptable. I don't and, get that vibe from, from and, Gio. you know, honestly, if, and this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous, but if I had to pick another player on the team to give the captaincy to, it'd be Matthew Kachuk. Because he gives a shit every game. I he's his effort level is always a hundred percent. He's always trying to do his best for the team. That's what you need. Like if and yeah, it's ridiculous because he's eighteen and the youngest of the everybody on the team. But you know. yeah, I don't know. I know what you're saying. I think I'd probably go with someone like a fro league right now. Just oh, I know you'd probably have an interstitial captain veteran. for a year or yeah. two. Sort of like uh, after, I think it was Lowry stopped being captain, and then it became Conroy, then again, it might end up being something like that. But but it just seems like there's not enough accountability and not enough guys angry about these losses. Like No. You know, I, I, was like, in the, I was in the dressing room after the Edmonton loss, and they, they just kind of sounded like, eh, you know what, it was a loss, we happened. need to do better. Yeah, big deal. And, you know, oh, well, we need to do better. And it's like, well, talk is cheap, and you guys keep saying that, and you're not. So... I don't really think the captain needs to be screaming at his team, but at some point I think the captain needs to be sort of responsible for the on ice product in a way and say, you know what guys, we've all let each other down and this is unacceptable. This is not flames hockey. Yeah. Well, like that's why I said Kachuk because he seems to be the only guy who's consistently there doing the right things, at least on the on ice. So we'll see. And I'm not saying, you know, strip Geo this oh, year, no, but I just no. think it's maybe it's time to look at a different things, leadership like, structure. Yeah, like maybe in two years from now or something like that. Like, especially if these problems keep happening, then something has to be done. Yeah. Right I now, just... the right now you can kind of chalk up part of the problem being that the entire team is not made entirely 100% properly, so their struggles are partially brought up by that. But, yeah, but even then, we need to be seeing individual performances from Johnny Hockey, from Sean Monahan. Yeah, oh, I agree. TJ Brody. Like, I don't. I think the team is as good as it's. I mean, yeah, it has weaknesses, but every team has weaknesses. I think that you know, even our goalies, we're not getting the performances we need, and somebody has to be kicking their butt for that. And obviously, you know, the coaches are trying, but I think there needs to be accountability within the players too. Mm-hmm. So, just a thought I had. I'm not saying go and strip Geo, but I'm just oh, wondering. No. If, you know, and he was kind of the heir apparent when Jerome left. Jerome left, we needed a captain. Geo made sense at the time, but I wonder if it's time to sort of reevaluate that choice. Yeah. It's sort of like when Brian Campbell was, I, if I recall correctly, he was the captain in Chicago when they were in the middle, early part of their rebuild, and then eventually it switched over. So I think you might see something along those lines with Giordano being the captain for the early part of the rebuild and then 
whichever of the young players it seems most appropriate with move it on the C on to that person. See, the thing to remember about being the captain here in Calgary, too, is there's a lot more duties than just hockey. I mean, that's our community face, all that sort of thing, and I'm not sure Kachuk is ready for that yet. So I think it needs to be a veteran at least for the next little bit. Yeah. Well, honestly, I don't see Gio getting replaced as captain for until, like, 2019 or something like that. So uh, Yeah, I think it depends who we bring in the off season, but yeah. Yeah, but again, we'll see. Everything's a little up in the air until then. Talking about Geo, another question I wanted to pose to you was from Geo's t- um, Geo's partner last year. I was going to say his tag team partner, but his defensive pair partner last year was TJ Brody. And, I mean, together, last year and even the year before, those guys looked unstoppable. They looked like probably one of the best tandems in the league. This year, the coach has broken them up. We have TJ Brody and Dennis Weidman are often playing together, and Mark Giordano and Dougie Hamilton are often on the ice together. And while I like the Geo-Hamilton pairing, I wonder if maybe the Brody and Geo thing, to get the most out of both those guys, I wonder if they have to be together. I'm almost thinking that together they're better than the sum of their parts. What do you think, Matt? I have two words. Jay Bomeister. Now, the Florida Panthers are my second favorite team as any dedicated listener had knows and i was extremely pumped that the flames actually were going out to get bullmeister because he's a very deceptive defenseman and like how he generated a lot of his offense was by sneaking in behind everybody and being wide open and his teammates would find him and he'd score and then he came to calgary the coach didn't like that approach didn't play him that way, and he had the worst season of his career. And it wasn't until Bob Hartley actually said, hey, this is how you normally play. Go out and do it. And then he had a resurgence in his career. Well, TJ Brody, even though he's a left-shooting defenseman, plays on the right side. That's what he's comfortable with. That's how he does things. And he's getting shoehorned on the left side where he's visibly not comfortable. And the coaching staff is handcuffing him, both in terms of that and his defensive partner, who is at this point marginally north of an AHL defenseman. I mean, even England has been playing better than Weidman. So, you know, give Brody England. So it's one of those situations that between the off-ice stuff with his girlfriend being diagnosed with MS and getting put in an uncomfortable situation where he's not used to playing on that side and being saddled with a poor defensive partner, it's just a complete recipe to screw TJ Brody up. And And I'm really hoping he hasn't fallen out of favor. Like, you always see some player fall out of favor with the coaching staff, and we haven't really seen that yet, at least visibly with Gullitson. No. But I'm wondering if maybe it's Brody. Well, honestly, like, what I'd like them to do is put TJ Brody back on the right side and leave him there. And, And he should be able to recover at least a decent portion of his abilities just based off of playing where he is comfortable. And then, you know, eventually in the off season, what I'd like to see is a true left pairing defenseman brought in. That's a legitimate number four to put in with him as the three, four pairing. But we have to wait till the off season for that. But he's just not getting used the right way. And it would almost be like if you put Gaudreau in as a defensive hitting forward on the fourth line. Well, yeah, that's not his game. Stick him in with Furland and Hathaway? Yeah, and like, okay, go hit everybody. Uh, do you see my size? Um, what are you thinking? Well, it's the same, like, it, that's just not how Brody operates. And yeah, he's an NHL defenseman, but... You know, think of it like if you were, say, like writing, right, and you're right-handed, and now you're being told to write with your left hand, you're not going to be writing anything with any clarity whatsoever, and it's going to take a very long time to make that adjustment. 
Well, so, I guess that's my question. Like, you know, he is obviously the better guy on his on his pairing, no doubt. Oh yeah. So I guess I'm trying to figure out why man, why the coaching staff is making him switch sides, not somebody like Weidman, and be like, well, you know what, this guy doesn't really matter anyways. Well, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's like his contract's up at the end of the year. We would rather, you know, focus on the guy who's going to be here for a while and put the veteran who should be able to adapt better into that odd spot. Well, the thing is, is that you're either going to have to force one of the five, six guys up or have England up. And do you want to play a guy like Derek England 20 plus minutes a night? See, and I understand. Like, that's where, like, it, it's one of those situations. But do you want to play Doug- Dennis Weidman 20 minutes a night? Well, they are, so. Based on what we've seen, I'd rather play England than Weidman. I'd rather play Kulak or Yoki Paka than Weidman, but... And that was the next thing I was going to say, is what if we gave... And it doesn't have to be forever, but just to try it. What if we give Kulak and Brody a shot? I know, and... Uh, like I mean, we're playing I, terrible hockey as it is. We're probably going to lose a bunch more. Let's just, you know, we can't yeah, do any worse well, than we're doing. especially if the Flames are out of it by, say, mid-February, uh, like around the, where the, when they play the Flyers. Uh, if that's the case, then perhaps... Like guys like Weidman might actually get traded off the team, in which case then you've got to try different things in order to see what you have with all the pieces that are remaining. I understood the coach wanting to switch those guys at the beginning of the year, just like he did Johnny Monty, and see what you've got and see what you can salvage, or not what you can salvage, but I guess what you can get if you put them with different partners. But to me, at some point, you have to sort of abort the experiment. And if you look at it, I think. I would rather, at least for me, I would rather have Geo and Brody together as my number one pairing and then find another partner for Hamilton instead of spreading out Brody and Geo. I just think they play so much better when they're together. I don't want to ruin that chemistry. Well, honestly, though, I think Hamilton is the best defenseman on the team. So you want him being the number one defenseman. It's like if the Flames could find a suitable partner for Hamilton being a legitimate first pairing defenseman, then you have Geo and Brody as your second pairing and hey, that's awesome. You know what I mean? But so like I can understand them wanting Geo with Hamilton. It's just trying to figure out how to get all of the pieces to work on the Rubik's Cube and the coaching staff hasn't quite solved it yet. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, as much as I, you and I both agree that Carl Alsner would be a great guy here, I think he would be a better partner for Hamilton than he would for Brody. Yeah, oh, I agree, and that's exactly how I'd play it, and with Alsner and Hamilton being, like, the de facto first, like, both, honestly, both the first and second pairing are going to be playing between 22 and 25 minutes a night anyway, so it doesn't really make that much of a difference what you label them as but yeah. i i could see that next year if that that's how it shook out yeah so i i guess to me i'm just looking at it saying you know what we've tried this experiment and the coach seems adamant on the weidman brody pair like to me it's time to start experimenting let's try kulak there let's try yoki paka there heck let's even try maybe hamilton and brody like i think it's just we i know to... maybe it some point later on maybe you bring up shillington or anderson and hey have a few games see how it goes well see i could see putting a guy like that or kulak with geo as a second pair yeah you know like, let the, uh, any let which the way veteran kind of yeah kind of walk like, them through it and yeah like especially like if the flames are out of it um, then why not throw everybody out there like even guys like jankowski and uh shin Carrick and klimchuk and that but I'm saying Mondo even Penny, before we're like out everybody, of everybody, no, you know what I mean, like just experimental. Well, and we everybody. we've seen that in the past. Like usually the Flames make massive roster changes after the deadline. Remember so. the one year they brought up so many guys that they had to find replacements in the AHL. Oh, I know. But I'm just saying, without even bringing guys up, just shuffling the deck chairs that we have already. You know, just saying, okay, this obviously what we have isn't working. So don't even call a guy up at this point. Just move the pieces we have around. And maybe you'll strike lightning that we didn't already know about. Yep. Like to me at this point with where the flames are, they're in the second wild card spot, but they're barely hanging on. Give it a shot and see. I think, I don't know about you. I've kind of, 
Yeah, they might make it, but I'm kind of, at this point, I think I've resigned myself that they're probably not going to make the playoffs. That's basically where I'm at. I don't want to say I've written the season off yet. Points percentage, they're in the bottom 10. Exactly. Unless they go on a long winning streak, like uh, the one in December, they're not going to get back uh, as many points. But even then, if you look historically, for every win streak this team goes on, then they go on a losing streak. I know. So I'm not saying I'm writing the season off, but just in my gut right now on, you know, the end of January. Oh, yeah. Well, like if you're a betting person, you wouldn't be betting on Calgary. No. So just some interesting ideas there for the defense and some I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, Moving to the forwards, we're going to spend some time on the forwards tonight. Before we talk about our UFA forwards, wanted to throw some ideas by you for the forward lines. Again, with kind of the way the Flames have been playing, I spent some of the weekend thinking about forward lines and what could we do to, to move some of these guys around. There's, You know that I like the gaudreau Monahan pairing. I know what you've said, and I agree with you in a way about moving that talent to two different lines, but I think you need to establish a top first line first. And we've seen the Goudreau still getting slashed. We've seen he's still getting picked on. I don't know what you do to fix that besides put some toughness on his line. And I'm looking down the roster thinking, why don't we try Kachuk there on the right wing? What if we were to go with a Goudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk line for line one, and then Backlund and Froelich, we add Bennett to that line on the left wing, take him off center, and try to reignite his game a little bit. Couldn't hurt. And with the Boma having the flexibility of being a center as well as a winger, you could make the third line, say, Versteeg, Stajan, and Brower, and then the fourth line, Furland, Boma, and either Hamilton or Hathaway. And you'd still have, like, decent lines one through four. Yeah. I guess I'm just thinking that, you know, Kachuk is the guy that's going to do the dirty work. He'll get in the corners. He'll fight oh, I for agree. the puck. And, and honestly, put a... like, if you were to put Kachuk with Gaudreau and Monaghan, I'd actually shift Gaudreau over to the right wing just because he's smart enough to be versatile. when it Like, he, he plays on the right wing anyway on the power play most of the time, so... Yeah, I think not? you could... Yeah, you could try it both ways. Yeah. You know, even every shift switch him up, just see what works. But... Yeah, I think that I'm just looking at kind of our lineup and thinking there has to be some changes made. And I think that we need some toughness on that first line, especially with Gaudreau still getting picked on. And this would let Gaudreau and Monaghan do what they do best, which is move the puck towards the net. And if Kachuk can do all that dirty work, he's still a great puck mover and he can still score and pass on his own. But I think that would be a great pairing there. And Bennett, as we've talked about, is struggling a bit. And I think he might be able to get something going with Backlund and Froelich. If nothing else, he could work on some of his two-way game. Yep, I can't argue with anything that you said. So, And, you know, the third, fourth line at that point, like you said, I mean, it, there's two or three ways it could go. You just kind of intermix those guys until you find the ones you like. Yep. So just some thoughts I thought I'd throw out there, see what people think. If you guys agree or disagree, let us know on Twitter or Facebook. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see, and I think we might hopefully see some more movement of the lines both up front and on the back end once the Flames resign themselves to not making the playoffs. Well, we're talking about forwards, Matt. We are gonna. We mentioned last week that we did part one of a series looking at roster moves, and today we're going to look at uh, part two, which is the forwards. Next week will be our goaltenders in net, looking at who's going to be back, who might not be back, who do we have in the system to replace them, that sort of thing. So last week we talked about the defense. We talked about the you know the possibility that we might have three defensemen not coming back and what's available on the unrestricted free agent market. The Flames are doing pretty good up front. For the first time in a while, they don't have a lot of free agent forwards. They've got Christopher Stieg, who's an unrestricted free agent. And then they have Ferland, Chase on Bennett, and Hathaway, who are all RFAs. I don't think there's any question that the Flames will probably qualify all of those RFAs. What do you think? I don't think they qualify Chase on, but they try to just basically sign him because I know you have to uh, give him a raise of X dollars to qualify him. I can't remember. I think it's 10%. I was going to say, I think it's 10%. And they may just opt to not do that and just say sign him for 750 or a million or whatever. Yeah, he's making 800000 now. I don't think he's worth a million. I think we could find yeah, another piece like in the farm for that. Say whatever yeah. you know what i mean like yeah if, if 
it works where you have to qualify them and then just get them to sign the qualifying offer, that's fine. See, to me, I think I would move on from Chase on, but I think, that he, I think he's Gullitson's guy, and I can see him coming back because of that. Yeah. And I think that like, that Realistically, is, I think the, the Flames would be better off just letting him go, but... I think that position is replaceable through our AHL depth. Yeah. Like, if you're intending on keeping him as the 13th forward, then sure, why not? He's big, I guess. Yeah, but then you'd have to like you'd have to find a place for Hamilton. Yeah. Um, Furlan, I think he'll stick around. He may not be a flame. I think he could get taken by Vegas. I don't think it's likely, but I think he could be taken. But I think that they'll yeah, resign and him. Realistically, if you're looking at anybody that the Flames would expose, like there's not really a lot of talent there. Like uh, no. Matt Stajan is probably the best option, or just signing Derek England might even be better. In terms yeah. of value, uh, like it. I don't think the Flames would do it, but I think that they, I think they should do it, but I don't think they will. Let's put it that way, and that's expose Troy Brower. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily. I don't think they will because I think no. the GM might think you know that I'm giving up on my new contract. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, if we lose Furland, I think we're still doing pretty well. No, um, and by the way, speaking of Brower, it. Everybody didn't really like for leak signing last year and he did have a down year last year and a lot of people thought he was overpaid and then this year oh for leaks awesome. So you know took some adjustment. Yeah, like Brower And, and I'm not saying Brower's terrible, but no, you know no, he's, it, he's making just, just a little talking, more than for like, leak. Yeah, I'm just talking it like in generalities cuz I've heard a lot of harping on him. Well, yeah, Froelich got the same treatment last year, and he's doing a lot better now that he's adjusted to playing in Calgary. So, Brower could very well be an instrumental part of the team next year. So, See, the difference to me is I liked Froelich when we signed him. I thought we were overpaying him, but I liked the player. Yeah. I like what he brings, and I think he has a unique piece. I don't really get what Troy Brower brings besides a right wing position. Like, I just don't think he's unique enough to, for them to find that niche for him. But we'll see. I hope, I hope it's not a bad contract. Oh. Um, you know, he's a veteran, if nothing else. It's always good to have vets around, but he's an expensive veteran um, at $4.5 million. But I think, they'll keep, I, I think they should expose him because it doesn't hurt. I don't think he'll get taken, but I think it would not hurt to expose him. Bennett will obviously be back, and that that's going to be an interesting deal to see what happens as an RFA, where he gets on the spectrum. I mean, I think I think he'll get about three and a half million just looking at yeah. where other contracts are at. Yeah, I'm thinking like in the two and a half to three range for two years. Yeah, you know, the the your prototypical bridge contract. And uh, Hathaway, I think no question gets either re-signed or qualified. Yeah. So really, if you look at that, then um, that leaves Versteeg spot with question, and that's really and maybe Chase on spot. So potentially two spots. We talked about this the week that you weren't here, and uh, Mike and I talked about is Versteeg worth bringing back? And I said to me, I think part of the the charm of Versteeg is he's cheap. He's made of glass. We've seen several times this year that he's just not um, not up for the challenge, if you will. He's always getting hurt and he's injured. So I wouldn't want to see this guy making two million or three million because I don't think he'll live up to it. Right now he's making nine hundred fifty thousand. I think he's a bargain at that price. Matt, would you bring Versteeg back? And if so, what would you pay him? Not at all, and I wouldn't even offer him a contract personally. I, I think that if we were lacking veterans. It might be easier too. Yeah, it's just. But with a guy like, like Brower. Yeah, um, like when you've got Weidman's money coming off the books, it's not like the Flames are going to be cash strapped like they were this year. You've got at least five and a half million to play with, and why not dump that money towards a proper top six right winger? And the Flames need desperately somebody who can actually play on the right side in a top six role so go out and spend the money to get a proper player for that not 
a cheap guy that's doing very well. Like, I'm not slamming Versteeg, and he will get a contract somewhere. It's just, it doesn't make any sense for it to be here. I would bring Versteeg back in if we could get him for less than a million. If we Yeah, the but that's deal, not going to happen. I don't know. I don't think he's shown enough where he's going to get snapped up right away. I wouldn't be surprised no, to see I him think a, like a, a training uh, camp walk-on again. Yeah, I think a one or two year deal at like two million per for a team that's lacking basically in the situation that Calgary was, I think could make sense. I don't even know if he's gonna get that much. Two million yeah. is sort of the new I wanna say two million is a new million, but it used to be that everyone just kinda of got million dollar contracts. And now everyone seems to be getting the, you know, two to two point five. And I just don't see Versteeg getting that. I don't think after what he's shown and the injuries he's had that he's even going to get a million seven. Yeah. I think he'll end up going to either a team like the Coyotes who need some veterans or end up somewhere like Vegas who's trying to assemble some veterans for the first time. And that's the only place I could see him getting big money. Otherwise, I think he'll get less than one, let's say 1.25. Um, Could I very well be. I wouldn't rule him out, but I would kind of look at him as your as your – 13th forward he's a good veteran guy you can step in when you need him to but he's not a guy i want in the lineup for 60 70 80 games Mm -hmm. yeah and it depends like uh like say the flames finish in the bottom five right and they get owen tippett well likely owen tippett would be actually in the flames lineup next year just because of his size and Mm -hmm. the fact that he's a shooting right winger it would make sense now, that would obviously take one of the right wing spots that would be vacated by Chase on and Versteeg. Barring that, if the Flames don't get that ki- kind of a player in, then I think that you could potentially bring Versteeg back to be like your third line right winger or left winger, depending. That's a cheaper guy. But honestly, I don't see that being like choice number one for him or the flames to be perfectly honest. I I think they have so much forward depth. Now you'd have to look at that third line spot as, is there a guy that we could promote that would be of equal sort of caliber? Yeah. And like, honestly at this rate, I think like if you put Hunter and Carrick in there full time, I don't see much of a difference. No. I mean, if we look at the guys listed as left wing, we've got Emil Poirier who, I don't think the Flames are ready to bring up full-time yet. Uh, Hunter Shinkarek, I think, would be a good guy. I thought he'd make the team out of camp this year. Morgan Klimchuk, I think, not quite ready yet. Brett Pollock, not ready. Maybe Mangiapan, but I don't think he's necessarily there quite yet. No. Um, like If he was bigger, then I think you could just slot him in right now. It's just that with his size, I think you're going to want to see him in the A for another year or two just for getting used to playing with men instead. I agree. Like, he's doing good, but you don't want to run... You know, unless you're a guy like Gaudreau where the talent is overwhelming, smaller players, it's just better to ease them in a bit. Yeah, I think that if we're looking at that as a bottom six position, which I am, I don't think that in a, no. on a team that's a playoff team, Versteeg is near top six anymore. I think you're better to bring somebody up from the bottom, from the AHL for that, because we've got to start moving those guys through there. And I think that Shin Carrick is at that point where he's almost like where Granlin was when we traded him. He's, as you called, you know, used the term last year, a sort of, quadruple a guy he's too good for the ahl but not quite for the nhl full-time and i think shin carrick's at that level right now yeah and you have to actually give players like that the opportunity to put up or shut up Mm -hmm. at some point and like honestly with berchi and grandland the flames had too much depth where they weren't going to get that kind of an opportunity, so it made sense to cash those assets in. But, you know, we we can't just keep trading guys that are decent for other prospects that are decent and, you know, keep cycling that on. Like, you have to eventually promote guys and see what they have. Yeah, and I think Shin Carrick for bottom six guys, it would be just fine. Yeah, and I he's think got he'll... a physical edge to his game, so I don't see him 
looking out of place on either the third or fourth line. Just looking at the Flames' history, and especially if True Living is still GM this summer, I see them go out and trying to free agent shop for one right winger. Yeah, same here. They've done that the last two years. They brought in Froelich. They brought in Brower. I think you'll see them shop for a big name right winger. TJ um, Oshie. <laughs> TJ Oshie would be my preference, and I think he'd do well here, but I wonder if he's going to be the most highly sought after guy, and we might have to overpay significantly. Yeah. Possible. It, if it wasn't Oshi, who would you like to see them go out and get as a right winger? Uh, honestly, at that rate, I'd probably trade for somebody just because the UFA depth isn't spectacular, and I think that, that you'd be better off dealing, like sort of like the Hamilton trade. Like, find some right winger that's decent, that's kind of falling out with his team. And like even if it costs our first rounder at this draft or the next one, so be it. So looking at some of the free agents that are available, um, David Pasternak is, I believe, RFA. Yeah. Um, well, so we, we wouldn't go for him. Radulov's an RFA. Nito Niederreiter is an R. Oh, no. Sorry. Radulov's a UFA. So I could go. I could see the Flames going after him, but I'm not sure he'd fit well here. Patrick or TJ Oshi is a UFA. That would be my first choice. Uh, Yermer Yager, I don't want to touch. Just too old. I don't know. You're right. There's not a ton of guys. Like they're all older guys. You got Burroughs. You got Doan, um, Jerome McGinley, Drew Stafford, maybe, but I wouldn't look at him as a top, you know, top line winger. I think Drew Stafford would be a a middle six guy. But other than that, I mean, Tommy Wingles might be the best guy on this list. Yeah. So it's not like, a great. Yeah, that's where. Like, it might not even be a bad idea to try Gaudreau as a right winger anyway, just to see if he's comfortable doing that, just to kind of solve that problem because of the fact that you can easily find a left winger, organizationally, even. Just, like, shift Kachuk up, put Bennett on left wing, and you, you've got your top six left wingers, you know, yeah. easily solved. So... TJ Oshi right now is making four point five million uh, with the six Capitals. and a half would probably be where like a five or six year deal at six and a half. I was gonna say what I, you're I don't looking think at. You, yeah, I don't think you pay him more than you do uh, Goudreau Monahan. I think no. he kind of falls in the same area there. Yeah, and like honestly, a five year, say thirty three million dollar contract. Yeah, it's expensive, but at the end of the day, it's not really going to kill you. So. And you got to spend the money to make the money, right? You've got to yeah. go. Oh, yeah. And well, especially like players. when you're wasting like $8 million on two defensemen that are like six, seven guys. Like, it's. Well, I mean, like just if you're point... investing that money in actual players that are worth that much, then. You know what I mean? Like, it's. Well, I mean, if we put it into, you know, relative terms, so let's just say six, five for the sake of argument. So really, if we get rid of Weidman, who's making five point two five, we get need we would be paying Oshi then about a million and a quarter more. Yeah, like which you, is you no know, big to me, deal. it's not like we don't have the money. We've got it tied up now in the wrong spots. We got Smeed coming off the books. There's another three million. So between those two contracts, you can bring Oshi in. Yeah, and you're and not going to miss have anything Brody, on the blue line. Brower and Oshi, and have that whole trade on your team. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Um, the one guy I didn't mention earlier, because I think we're in agreement here, Brandon Bolig is UFA. He's done. Oh, yeah. I, no, Europe or retired. No I reason don't. to bring him back. Yeah. Um, and all the other Ford UFA or RFAs they're going to sign. Lyndon Vay, I think they'll re-sign. He's a good AHL well, hand. It's one of those things that, like, if you lose them, who cares, really? Like, you can always find next year's version of that guy, if need be. So it sounds like our consensus then is that we'll probably end up losing Versteeg and maybe Chase on, and we would replace them with Shin Carrick and hopefully Oshi. Yeah, or some other guy via trade. I just don't know what all... assets we want to give up. Yeah, well, there's that, always that are going to get you a top line guy. Well, at that rate, you're not necessarily looking for a top line guy either. Like you're basically like if you find somebody that's the equivalent of what hoodler was when we brought him in like 
the guy that I'm thinking of that would be perfect in that uh, position would be Gustav Nyquist. Just a decent second line right winger and can play either on the first line or the third line. Just that versatility can play with anybody, basically. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I think that's And like with the Red it. Wings are, you know, going to be in rebuild mode. They're not necessarily going to be wanting to keep a hold of a guy that's 27 years old and, you know, like at the his prime when they're in rebuild mode. They, I think they'd rather have the assets in return. And like two years ago, Nyquist scored 27 goals. The year before that, 28. And last year he had a bit of a down year. This year he's half point per game. So, you know it's one of those situations where I don't think the acquisition cost would be astronomical. Like it might even be as little as a second round pick and a decent prospect. So we'll see. Yeah. I think that I would still go with, um, I, I think that I, Gustav would be a good option. I think he'd be my number two. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I o- would, I'd rather Oshie's sign one. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather sign Oshi cause you're not having to waste the, asset acquisition cost well even then i just think he's a better player like oh i agree you know i yeah he'd be my first choice yep. so forwards not a lot's going to change there and i think in a lot of ways that's good that we i mean we're going to see massive movement on the blue line i think almost half our defense are gone you don't want too much of a turnover and last year we saw a lot of forwards turnover so now it's the defense's turn. And I, for the most part, I like this forward core. If we we're getting out of them when we should be, I think we've got a good core there that just needs a couple tweaks. Yeah, by and large. like Even on the defense, we only need one guy, basically, and I think the rest we can fill internally. Are so. there any forwards right now that you think who are wearing a flaming C now that won't be, uh, say, come training camp next year? Lance Boma and Matt Stajan. I think Stajan gets claimed in the expansion draft, and I think the Flames deal Lance Boma. Because every team is wanting players like Boma, and at, while at 2.2 is a little much for a fourth-line guy like that, it it's not overly so, and it's only no. the one year. Yeah, I think you'd have a lot of suitors for Boma. I think you could even move him this year almost as a you know rental plus. Rental mm-hmm. plus one year, because he's fairly cheap, but... Yeah, I mean, like honestly, I wouldn't expect much from him, like maybe a fifth round pick or something like that. Well, I was thinking about this over the All Star weekend. What would you think if the Flames traded him to Vegas? I could see them wanting a guy like that, another you know younger veteran guy. Yeah, get a pick back from him. I wouldn't be opposed to that. I could just see them looking for a guy like that, you know, in a trade or even offering Boma to them to not take somebody that we might leave unprotected. Yes. Lance Here, Bowman, have Boma, cons- so that way you don't take Furland. Say. Yeah, you know, it's a Lance Boma for future considerations is what it would show in the record books. And we always see that happen with the expansion draft. Um, interesting news, speaking of the expansion draft, I don't know your thoughts on this quickly, is um, a lot of people have been talking about how the Flames might be able to trade for Fleury for cheap if they were interested in Marc-Andre Fleury. Uh, it's come out of Pittsburgh that if... Flurry is still on the roster come time for the expansion draft. They're planning to just buy him out. And at that point, if you were the Flames GM, would you make a run at a free agent Mark andre Flurry? Give us your first-round pick and tag Flurry along with it. Mm. Why don't they nice even do anything? I think they just buy him out. Well, it depends on what management, like the ownership wants. Like yeah. if they would rather give the pick up than the cash, then... Hey, give us a first or a second or something. You know. Yeah, the, the nice thing about a free agent flurry, I mean, he's on a pretty reasonable deal right now. I think he's making 4.5. Um, I'd have to go check. But, you know, he would probably take, usually you see these guys take half that when they sign after they've got bought out because they got a ton of money. And I think you could bring in a guy like that as a veteran goalie for maybe $3 million. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think that, like, uh, the Flames should, like, unless they are getting some incentive, I I wouldn't bother with 
acquiring Flurry. I'd... I think it's better in a trade where, like you said, yeah, you're getting some incentive. You're getting a first or a second. Yeah, he's uh, making 5.75 for the next right. two years after this one. So, yeah, I'd want a first plus a good prospect so, at that rate. So what if you were to trade, say, Boma and, you know, something for Flurry in a second? Yeah, I'd honestly, I'd rather just not do no. that. So. It's, it's interesting to look at. I mean, that was one of the guys they talked about last summer. We'll talk about goalies next week, but I think that Ben Bishop may be another option for the Flames. Um, I personally don't want to pay what I think it'll be worth, but we'll talk about that next week. Oh, here's another bit of news from today. Uh, the Barclays Center is kicking the New York Islanders out of their building after the season. Where are they going to play? Have fun with that. New Doesn't York. Edmonton have an empty arena? Well, it might end up being that they have to do some slash slapdash renovations in the Coliseum and bring it back or move somewhere for a season or something. Do you think but, Vegas can get their money back on the expansion fee and just buy that team? Who knows? I can't, maybe, I just, uh, maybe Carolina will relocate to Quebec and then the Islanders will just play in Carolina for a year. <laughs> well, I think if you're gonna, yeah, that would be weird. I think if you're gonna do that, you just end up moving the uh, the Islanders to Quebec. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I think that we're seeing the NHL in an interesting time now with a few teams that are on the rocks. Carolina, I think honestly, is as sad as it is because they're a storied franchise. I think this might be the beginning to the end of the Islanders. Mm-hmm. You know the the Hurricanes, eh, they're not really that storied of a franchise. They were when they were in Hartford, but. I think this might be the beginning of the end of the Islanders. And it's not like the New York area is not going to be served by hockey. They've got the Rangers. They've got the Flyers. They've got, you know, New Jersey. So there's lots of teams in that area. Mm -hmm. I think that just, I mean, the Islanders, I think, have been the worst of them for a while. And maybe the market's just sour Pretty much since the early to mid-90s. And that's terrible. a terrible arena they're in, too. Oh, I know. Like, it's got posts in the way and there's a car next to the ice nobody can see through and it takes up seating room and it's i, I want to know who thought this is the best arena they've got yeah the other thing i was looking at because i was looking at where you could put them the, the old meadowlands arena in new jersey is not being used but has not been knocked down yet so maybe they could find the keys for that thing but it really doesn't make sense if the islanders aren't playing on the island does it who knows what are they doing with the old alcatraz building i don't know there's an island People have to paddle their way out to the rink. Yeah, the San Francisco Islanders, I guess. There you go. The Yeah, I don't know, the San Francisco inmates. I always thought the Islanders was a dumb name in and of itself. But. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, interesting, interesting times. We'll see what happens with some of these teams. But I honestly think by 2020, you see a different landscape in the NHL. I think that the Vegas thing is the start, not necessarily of expansion but i think it's the start of sort of some movement just like we saw in the 90s when we saw the you know quebec move to colorado hartford move to um what was it hartford to carolina and quebec to phoenix i think that we're about to see a little sort of realignment like that again um and that's going to happen every once in a while as the political and economic climates change so We'll see, but that's my prediction. I think we'll see two, maybe three teams relocate in the next three to five years here. We were talking about some players that the Flames need to bring in or maybe need to get rid of. And not a lot of people know, but the Flames signed a new defenseman today. And he is the shortest player on the team. Johnny Goudreau no longer holds that record. The new Flames defenseman who they signed, his name is Fionn Daly. And he's from uh, Kilkenny, Ireland. Born on August 19th, 2007, which makes him nine years old. He's four foot five and weighs 86 pounds. Shoots right. This was a deal the Flames announced on uh, today when we're recording, which is January 30th. And this was a make a wish kid. And he came in, he got to become part of the team. He signed a contract for a day, he practiced with the Flames, sat on their meetings. These things always warm my heart to see these kids in you know, the Make-A-Wish program and other such programs with the Flames Foundation and whatnot, getting to experience their dreams. They had a press conference where Brad Living introduced him and signed his contract. It was just, it was really awesome to see. And he's a sledge hockey player. Um, but I just, I love seeing these kind of 
things for the team. And it really shows that this hockey team is more than just a hockey team in the city. It's bringing dreams to people. It brings hope to people. It's just, it's a community staple. And that's what we were talking about earlier. when we talked about the captain and their role in this organization. And, you know, you need that, that ability to go out there and work the community. And that's the thing that's going to be hard for Vegas starting up is getting that community focus going, getting things set up the way they want them and figuring out, you know, what the community needs from them. But if anyone's interested, you can go to the flames website, uh, calgaryflames.com or flames.nhl.com. And you'll see a whole article about, uh, Fionn daily and his, his day with the flames. It's pretty cool to see. He got his own dressing room stall. He got his own Jersey. They did a signing of his contract and he got to go out on the ice and practice with the guys. So really great story here. And, um, I want to, I wanted to blame somebody cutting onions today when I read it. Cause I saw a tear in my eye, but I can't blame anybody. It's just, it's a great story. And the last one I remember like this was a couple years ago when there was a, a young kids hockey game and I guess Harvey the Hound was supposed to show up and didn't and the kids were disappointed and they brought them all the dome and gave them a dome experience and Beasley did the announcing and it was just, it was really heartwarming. So good for the Flames organization. I love to see these things in our, in our city. So Matt, the last topic I want to talk about this week, I don't know if you'll have anything else, but the last one I wanted to bring up was the controversial 100 greatest NHL players list that was announced during the All-Star weekend. Uh, most of these players are from 1967 to present, but there's some before that. And this was the NHL didn't rank them one to a hundred. They just kind of said, "Here's the grouping of the top hundred players." They didn't rank them. They didn't put them in any sort of order. They didn't want to play favorites. Looking at this list, there's some interesting choices here. If we look at former Flames, we have Grant Fear, Brett Hall, Al McKinnis, Joe Newendike. What are your thoughts over all of this list, Matt? Uh, by and large, I didn't have too many complaints over it. I know a lot of Flames fans are pissed off that Aginla wasn't put on, and I thought it was personally bad that Evgeny Malkin wasn't put on. But other than that, I don't have too many complaints. It there are some interesting choices, like Tim Horton. I thought was an interesting yeah, like choice. Yeah, he was a good defenseman, but he's pretty much only known for the coffee, and that's about it. And I think that there's some guys in here, even a guy like Brad Park. I thought uh, sort of an interesting nomination. I think there's some guys that are on here because of the name value. A guy like Tim Horton. Um, I also think they're trying to get a certain number from most of the teams. So. Yeah, some of these definitely almost seem like it's either the guy's done business with the league or he's famous, they put him in there. You and I talked before the show, and I would be really interested to see how they rank these. I mean, what is their sort of criteria for the top 100? And if it's just kind of the best players in their position by points or stats, that's one thing. But I think sometimes there's the intangibles. I think sometimes we see these players who, like an Aginla, like a... Uh, Lanny McDonald, who aren't the best player in the league, but they mean so much to their team. You know, Lanny was really the heart and soul of this team. He really helped with that Stanley Cup run. He became the face of the Calgary market, and I think he really helped sell the Calgary Flames, both in Calgary and otherwise. And I would have, I guess it just depends what you're rating them by. Yeah, and like if you look at a Ginla, undoubtedly from like 2000, 2001 to 0304, he was the best player in the league. But he, after the first lockout, he changed his game, and he became more of a finesse player like Alex Tangay, and like he just wasn't the same guy. And he lost a bunch of weight and just changed how he played entirely, and he became more of a secondary player who could just score goals, sort of like what Brett Hull was when he was with Detroit and that, and you can't build a team around a player like that, and that's part of the reason why the Flames seemingly always underperformed their team on paper from the post-lockout era right through until the rebuild. So, like, I can understand the justification of not having him in that top 100. Now, if you extend that list down to 110, I, I'm sure he's on it. But I can understand why they left him off. Malkin, though, you got me. 
I have no idea why he would like honestly he's he and Crosby and Ovechkin have been the three best players since they came in the league so I don't see how they overlooked that but and I think there's guys like a Brendan Shanahan who I might take off and put Malkin in well speaking of Shanahan I think Shanahan was like if Aginla had continued playing like he was from a 102 to 0304 through the rest of his career I think that's they would have been interchangeable those two names but it, it's just when Aginla lost that and became that more of a finesse guy that that's where Shanahan got the edge like I, in terms of raw talent I'd give it to Aginla I also think Shanahan w- looked better because he was on some really, really good Red Wings yeah. teams. Yeah, and Shanahan was a very good player for a long time, and he never really changed his game, unlike Aginla, and I think that was that separation between the two. Could be. So, I mean, for me, I would take Shanahan. I think Shanahan's a great player, but to me, Shanahan is always a supporting guy. Well, honestly, I he think never if like- you took Tim Horton off and threw Malkin in, I, like, I I would take Shanahan before Tim Horton. So That's yeah. true. I don't know. Maybe they got a coffee sponsorship for it or something. And, and uh, you know, I mean, there's guys like Brian Trottier who's on there again. Not sure I'd put him in the best hundred. Luke Robitaille, yeah, he's the highest scoring left winger in history. But again, not sure I'd put him in the top hundred. So, kind of interesting picks. Um, but overall, I think a pretty well done list. And TSN has their best best sixty seven since sixty seven as well. Mike Gartner's another one, or Mike Gartner, who I'm not sure I'd have in here, but. You know, it's got to be hard to pick a hundred from such a wide range of players that have come through the yeah. league. Yeah, and like I'm sure all the ones that missed the cut would basically be in the next ten or fifteen names on the list. So, well, ten ten years from now, we'll yeah. see when they're wearing the hundred and tenth patch on their glove instead, or on their yeah. sock, wherever they choose vertically to put it next on the time. back of their skates. Well, I think it's got to be on something more visible than that. Maybe it goes like on the knee of the socks. Okay. Or on the pants or something like that. Because you want people to see it, and you want people to want to buy one. Well, anything else you want to chat about, Matt? Let's head to the predictions. So neither of us did very well last week. We weren't really sure. Neither of us were all that happy with our predictions going into the All-Star break, but... There was two games on the docket, Montreal and Ottawa. I came the closest. I thought we'd get one point in an OT loss to Ottawa. We made it to OT, but we won the game. I guess shouldn't be complaining about no. that. And you thought the Flames would lose both of them and get zero points. So neither of us got a point last week. So it still sits 5-1 in my favor. It's like the Montreal yeah. game. Uh, this week, the Flames have still a pretty light schedule. They play on February 1st against Minnesota, the 3rd against New Jersey, and then the 5th is a matinee game here at the Dome against the New York Rangers, and that's a 12 p.m. start time. Uh, three games, one of which is at home. Or sorry, yeah, the M- Minnesota games at, ho- at home, the New Jersey and the Rangers games are both on the road, so they're going on a bit of a swing there. What do you think, Matt? Three games, prediction? Yeah, I'm going to be Debbie Downer and say zero points. Zero points yeah. again? Because you got to figure that both the Wild and the Rangers are two of the top five or six teams in the NHL. So likely we're going to have troubles with them. And New Jersey, they have a good pair of goaltenders with Kincaid and Schneider, and we typically don't do well against good goaltending. So, yeah, I'm going to go with a donut. I'm hoping that the team got some rest over the All-Star break and they're ready to go. I think they'll struggle against Minnesota, but I'm going to give them two points against New Jersey. Well, realistically, if the Flames have playoff aspirations, they need four out of the six. Yeah. And then, I mean, we won't look that far ahead, but the next week we have one game, which is the Pittsburgh Penguins on the 7th, and then they have their week break there. Uh, I think that's their bye week from the Wednesday to the Sunday. So 
they'll get some more rest there. So I almost feel like you've got to push through the tiredness, get these four done, and then take your rest. But overall, not a bad month. I mean, if we look at February, we play almost, besides that one week, we're playing almost every other day. We have a one back-to-back. So the team should, I hope, look a little more vibrant because they don't have as much excuse to say that they're tired. And not not a terrible schedule either. I mean, if we look at the teams, we got Pittsburgh, then we have Arizona, Philadelphia, Vancouver, Nashville, Tampa Bay, Florida, Carolina, and L.A. So not not a bad schedule. Not a great schedule, but not no, a bad schedule. It's pretty much evenly split between bad and good teams. So if they can And in March if they can get through it March then, will be a tough month. And be in a playoff spot, then maybe they have a chance in March, but And March is gonna be tough. We are literally playing for almost two and a half weeks every other yeah. day. Like the thirteenth, the fifteenth, the seventeenth, the nineteenth, the twenty first, the twenty third, the twenty fifth, the twenty seventh, twenty ninth, thirty first. Yeah. And then so in, in, it's gonna be a and tough. then the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth. So in April. Yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be a bit of a gong show for the Flames. It's every other day, so pretty f- much all, the, like the end of the season, be it, all of it. it. So I mean, if we're seeing them run out of gas now, this could really be where we see this team fall apart. But who knows? The, when the Flames have had adversity, they've rallied. Like when Giordano went down two years ago, and even when Gaudreau went down earlier this season. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll definitely see what happens. Um, I'm not really sure if we're gonna if we're gonna see a lot happen this month as far as trading goes. But I really think that um, you know we're a month away. March first is the trade deadline and i really think that we are in for some interesting things to happen i think that the flames if they're going to make a deal i think they should jump on it and try to beat the deadline because the team that beats the deadline usually gets the best yeah. deal well i think like and we yeah, saw that last I think year if too the flames say lose five or six out of the next eight games so like they're out of it well in advance then i think you'll start to see them dealing off people early and often yeah, I don't know about often. I don't know how well, much we really have yeah, to sell. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like anything that's not stapled down can move on. Like I, I think guys so, like Versteeg and Weidman, England might. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll definitely see what happens, and um, hopefully the Flames have a good week because I think that they really need to set the pace after their terrible end of January. I think that they need to come back in February and really show a different side of them. And if they don't, they're dead in the water. That's my thought. But, yeah, let's see what happens. Anyway, Matt, we will talk to you after those three games, just before the Pittsburgh game, and hopefully we are singing a different tune than we did in January. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll catch you next time. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat and to follow us on Twitter at fireside podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at the hockeywriters.com. Fireside chat is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution non commercial share alike license. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.